it is Sabbath. You know, when we read Genesis chapter 1 and we go through the, the ending statement of each day of creation, it says, and the evening and the morning was the first day, and the evening and the morning was the second day. And this tells us that because there was darkness before there was light, that the day starts with the dark period. It means, therefore, then, that each day starts with sunset. Um, you know, um, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 32 says, From even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. And Mark 1 and verse 32 says, At even when the sun did set. So what does that mean? When we put all of those texts together, it tells us that the Sabbath begins on sunset Friday and it ends on sunset Saturday. Now we know that the world has a different kind of a reckoning. Uh, for the world, the Sabbath or a day begins at midnight. And that is why we have in New York City, the falling of the ball on New, York, on, um, New Year's Day, um, celebrating you know, the beginning of a new year. But they are like 12 hours late when they do that because the day had started at sunset. So I just like to say a happy Sabbath. And there's something different about this day because Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, that God blessed this day, he sanctified this day, and he rested on this day. Oh, this is no ordinary day, no ordinary day. You know, I would like to tell you something that I find interesting, you know, and it's just from my own personal experience, and it may be anecdotal, but I remember when I used to keep guinea pigs. Um, you know, the kids used to have guinea pigs as pets, you know, and um, I don't know if this is scientific, but I think that those guinea pigs used to be calmer on the Sabbath. They, I think that they used to keep the Sabbath. And it's interesting because the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, the fourth commandment of the Sabbath, that it says that even our animals as well too should rest on the Sabbath. So somehow, just like the animals went into the ark, I'm sure that the animals have a connection with God as well so that they know as well too when the Sabbath um, comes around. Not your manservant, your maidservant, nor even your cattle. The, 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 the fourth commandment says, how oh, the stranger that is in your gate. And something tells me therefore then that even animals know that the seventh day Sabbath is a special day. So I want to say and greet you by telling you happy Sabbath indeed. But this evening, our subject is Revelation reveals deadly delusion. Revelation reveals deadly delusion. And as usual, before we go into the study of God's word, let us pray. Our loving Father and our God, open our eyes that we may indeed understand and see your truth as revealed clearly in your words. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. My topic tonight, Revelation reveals deadly delusions. You know, it is sometimes said that you never feel alone in the world until you have to tell your parents goodbye until you are standing by your parents' grave because it makes you start to think that, guess what? You are next in line. And so the question that haunts you is, can we find a hope that goes beyond the grave? You know, Tina was dying. Tina's father, rather, was dying, and she sat in the hospital at 3 a.m., and there, lying in, in, in the hospital bed was the man who had changed her pampers, who had changed her diapers, and she was, he was half of the size that he was before because um, he was dying from cancer. Um, he'd been a dock worker most of his life, but now cancer had reduced him to a shell of what he was before. Dad was dying, and he couldn't fight any longer. And so after the funeral, Tina thought that, you know, she'll be able to go on with her life. But every time she smelt the familiar musk scent of his perfume, she would think about her father again. And um, the memory of her father would rise up in her mind. She would catch as his favorite song. She would hear his favorite song. And all of a sudden, her heart would become sad once more as she starts thinking about her father. And she said, you know, I know I'm an adult. And I'm supposed to be strong, but there are some days I feel like I'm four years old and all I want is my dad. You know, there are millions of people in our world like Tina who are facing one of life's toughest, toughest rites of passage, watching a parent die. It is an experience 
uh, that's going to hit many of us hard as we journey into the next two years. And have you ever looked death squarely in the face and wondered what really happens at death? You know, the question really, the question really um, happens at death, what, about what happens at death, has a solid biblical answer. Now, I recognize that even Christians and non-Christians look at the subject of death in a different way. And so if you ask our Roman Catholic friends what happens when you die, most of them would say, well, you know, if you're good, you will go to heaven, and if you're not good, you will go to hell. And some teach that if you are not good enough for heaven, but too good for hell, that you would even go up to a place called purgatory. And purgatory is in between heaven and hell. Well, if you ask most Protestants what the alternative are, they would respond in a similar way. They would basically say that when you die, if you're good, you would go to heaven. And if you are not so good, you will go to hell. Then you go to some Protestant funerals, as I have been, and the preacher will say, well, you know, the person is right now um, um, in the grave awaiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then later on, that same preacher would say that that person is in heaven looking over the balconies on us. So the question is, where is that dead person? Is that person in the grave or is that person in, in heaven? So the question we need to answer from God's word, are the dead asleep waiting for the resurrection when Jesus comes or are they in heaven already? And if they are in heaven, and the question is, does the soul have eyes and mouth and, and ear and hands and feet? In other words, then can the soul speak? If the soul has eyes and a mouth and ears and they can see things up in heaven, the question is, why do they need to a resurrection? Why do they need to come back to earth in order to get their bodies? But they already have a body in heaven. So people are really perplexed and are confused about the subject of death, about what happens when someone dies. Is that person in heaven? Is that person in their grave? Is that person in hell? Or is that person not nowhere? They have gone back to nothingness. You know, there are many people, atheists, who do not believe in God, do not believe in the existence of God, who say that our physical bodies are all that there is. And when you die, you just go back to the grave, you go back to the dust, and that's the end of you. It's all over. It is finished. It's the end. It's final. Yet, there are others who also believe in a reincarnation, meaning there are some who think, for example, our Hindu and Buddhist friends, they think that when you die, you will fulfill your karma and you will come back in, re 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 in reincarnation or in transmigration and you might come back as a cow or you may come back as a servant. All depends on how well you did in this life. But you will come back as something so that you can learn the lessons that you did not learn in your former life. So the question we need to ask this evening then, is death the end? Is the soul immortal? Or is there a resurrection? You see, if the soul is immortal, then it could go to either heaven or hell immediately after death. But if the soul is not immortal, then that opens a way to the possibility of transmigration or reincarnation. So the whole issue of death, therefore, has to do with the question of immortality. Do we continue living even after we die? In other words, do we have immortality now? Will it be given to us at the second coming or do we have it now? Now, is it possible that the devil has a plan in the last days, a deadly delusion for people who believe this idea of the immortal soul. So he can masquerade, therefore, as our dead loved ones and deceive us. In other words, where can we find the answers? You know, there are so many books on near-death experiences and many videos I've seen on YouTube as well, too. And these books have been catapulted into best seller status. Many of today's bestsellers on death and dying teach that when a person dies, they are not really dead. Many of them teach that the dead can actually communicate with the living. And I've seen talk shows where the guests claim that they can 
talk to our dead loved ones and they would tell one of the other guests what their dead mother or dead father or dead child is saying right now. You know, spiritualism is exploding, particularly among people who have a secular bent, who rule out the Bible and Jesus. These people believe that when you die, there's this immortal essence that is within you that can communicate with the living. Now, would you agree with me tonight that the only reliable place for us to find real and true information about what happens when someone dies is found in God's word, the Bible. You know, the Bible gives us dependable answers to the question, what happens when you die? It reveals not only what happens when you die, but also how to face death with new hope and confidence. So let's start then at the book of Revelation. That is our main um, book. Let's look at what happens at the very beginning of Revelation that reveals our ultimate human destiny. Now, the very first chapter of Revelation introduces us to this glorious being, the person of Jesus Christ. And he is dressed in glowing white robe and his eyes are like the flames of fire. And Jesus identifies himself in this way in Revelation 1 and verse 18. He says, I am he who lived and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So Christ went into the grave and came out. He was resurrected from the dead. So throughout his life, Jesus experienced hunger and weariness and pain. You know, on the cross, the nails driven through his hands brought him pain. The crown of thorns on his head brought him pain. The spear and the lashes brought him pain. He, he, his real physical body experienced pain. It was also subject to hunger and fatigue. But when Jesus was resurrected and came out of the tomb, he was clothed now with an immortal body. And the Bible says that Jesus was resurrected. Then it goes on to say that what? I have the what? And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So the reason that we need not fear death is because Jesus Christ conquered death. On the cross, Christ took upon himself the condemnation of our sin. And so since the wages of sin is, is death, Jesus experienced death for us. Jesus went into the grave and came out. He has the keys to the grave. And believers who die in and rest in Jesus can look forward to the resurrection. In fact, the Bible reveals the truth of the resurrection throughout its pages. It points forward to the second coming of Christ when Jesus comes and the dead are resurrected. You know, but somebody might say, what does the Bible teach about the idea of the immortal soul? Well, um, as usual, let's go back to the beginning. You know, sometimes in order to understand the end, we have to go back to the beginning. So let's go back to the book of Genesis to the creation week to find a clue to what happens when a person dies. Now, maybe we, it's best for us to understand what happens when someone dies, if we can understand what happens when they were created, what happened at their creation. And so the Bible says this, Genesis 2 and verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now notice what the Bible says. What happens? The Lord God forms man out of God, out of the dust of the out of the dust of the ground. So God formed Adam out of dust, not stardust, but dust, dirt. That is the body. Then the Bible says that he breathed into him the breath of life. And the Bible says, God, and so the Bible says that. Man became a living soul. Now, notice here that it didn't say that God gave Adam a soul. Huh? God breathed into the dust of the ground, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So Adam was not given a soul. Adam became a soul. So, his, he, so he breathed into uh, his, his, his nostrils, um, the, the, the dust, 
to breathe in doing the bread of life and man became a living soul. And that is very important for us to understand. So then we have a simple formula, therefore, then, of how man was made up here. Uh, the dust plus the spirit give us a living soul. Huh? That is simple. So we have the element of the earth plus the breath give us what? A living soul. And so that is a formula. So a living soul simply means a living person. Adam became a living person when God breathed into the dust of the earth his breath and he became a living soul. You and I tonight are living souls, or we are a living person. Now, suppose you went to the supermarket, and when you came home, you said to your spouse, you know, I went to the supermarket today, and there was not one soul there. Now, your spouse might look at you and say, well, in a joking way, they might say, well, you know, um, it's a good thing you didn't see a soul, because you, you would have been really scared if you see a soul, because I've never seen a soul before. Now, right away, we know that that spouse would have been joking because we know in our natural language, when we say we didn't see a soul at a certain place, we mean that we didn't see anybody. So even today, we use the word soul as meaning a person. So the question is therefore then, what is this soul and is it immortal or can it ever die? Well, let us answer this question right away about whether the soul can die. You know, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 18 and verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine, says God. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And look at this statement. The soul who sins shall what? The soul who sins shall die. So right away, therefore, right away, therefore, we see then, right away, therefore, we see then that the Bible clearly tells us that the soul can die. Now, what is, so another name, therefore, then for soul in the Bible is simply a person or life. Again, look at some other translation. Um, the today's English version says, translate the same verse as the person who sins is the one who will die. Let us look at another translation. The Living Bible translates the same verse as saying, it is for a man's own sins that he will die. So we see, therefore, then, that there is no such thing in the Bible as an immortal soul, a soul that cannot die, something that is inside of us that cannot die. In fact, the Bible clearly tells us that God is the only one that has immortality. Now listen here. The Bible uses the word soul 1,600 times, and never once does it use the word immortal soul. Huh? That's important. Over 1,600 times, the word soul can be found in the body, but never immortal soul, never those two words together. Now, let us look carefully at what Jesus, the statement Jesus made in Matthew chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. And we're going to compare these two statements from Jesus, and we're going to understand again what is meant by the soul. Now, Jesus himself simply says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, note what he goes on to say now in verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own instead of life? Now, Jesus says soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So in verse 25, Jesus is says, uses the word life. life and in, this, in verse 26, he uses the word soul. So we see, therefore, then, that Jesus basically is indicating that the, your life or your soul is the same thing. Jesus would have said, lose your life or lose your soul, both are the same thing, as we see here in these two verses in Matthew chapter 16. Now, here we see that the Bible clearly tells us that only God is immortal. Mortal means subject to death. Immortal means imperishable. You cannot die. Some part of you that cannot die. So the Bible never uses the term immortal soul or the immortality of the soul. In fact, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17 says, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, 
the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Bible is referred to God or the king has been immortal. God is immortal. We receive immortality when Christ comes the second time because the Bible tells us that this mortal will put on what? Immortality. So when I come to Christ, he gives me the gift of eternal life. And that eternal life dwells in my heart right now. But the gift of immortality comes at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is why 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 says, He who is the blessed and holy potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. Notice the Bible says, that here what? Who alone has immortality dwelling in inapproachable light. Now, let us suppose I were to say to you that I am the only one who has my wallet. Now, if I alone have my wallet, it means that you don't have it. It means that no one else have it. Huh? That is what it means if I said I'm the only person that have my wallet. Who alone? So the Bible tells us that God alone has immortality, the one that dwells in the unapproachable light, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Bible is clear of this matter of immortality. So where did this idea of this immortal soul come from? How did it creep into the Christian churches? Well, um, um, pagan Greek um, philosophy thought that the soul is immortal. They thought that there's some part of us that continue living after we die. You see, the Greeks thought that the soul could live separately from the body. They thought that the soul was a distinct entity which had life on its own. But the Bible teaches that human beings are an integrated whole. We are made of our physical, we are made of our mental and spiritual. And these components are inseparable, meaning that one cannot live apart from the, um, cannot live apart from the other. So therefore then, Greek philosophy says that there's something in us that continues living, but the Bible, the Bible teaches differently. In fact, the Bible teaches that death is like a sleep. <laughs> the Bible, the believer who dies is as secure as if he was sleeping in the arms of Jesus, resting from the heartaches and disappointments of earth until that glorious resurrection morning. But, you know, Spiritualism teaches that the soul is immortal. Spiritualism teaches that when you die, there is this essence in you called the soul that continues to live and you can come back and communicate with the living. So do you see why this is such a deadly idea? Huh? Because what? The devil can use these false ideas about death in order to deceive us. And my dear friends, in the last days, that is exactly according to Revelation. That is what exactly the devil is going to do. His evil angels can masquerade as our dead loved ones. The uh, Bible says that, that, that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. They can take different forms. He knows how your grandmother looks. He knows how your grandmother looks. He knows how your girl looks. And come back to you in that form and deceive you. They can mislead us into accepting Satan's lies. But here is what the Bible says. My friends, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all sleep. Huh? Bible refers to death as a sleep, but we shall all be changed. He says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when shall we be changed? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and what will happen? And the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. Dear friends, this evening, when God created Adam, he placed his breath within him and not an immortal soul. Not a soul. Let's look, read Genesis 2 and verse 7 again. And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So therefore, what when some someone dies, then death is the creation 
in reverse. It means then if we separate God's breath from the body, then that person goes back to the dust. And let us see what the Bible tells us happens to the breath. So does the Bible say the soul goes back to God? It says what goes back to God. Listen to what the Bible tells us. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. It says, then the dust, this is the reversal of the creation now, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Someone says, ah, there it is, see? See, it says that its spirit goes back to God. No believer or non-believer, this is what happens to everyone. In fact, even animals, even animals, the Bible tells us, the spirit goes back to God. So whether you're good or bad, your spirit goes back to God. But let us see what takes place here. Is the spirit something that is conscious? Is the spirit that something that can go on living without the body? You know, is it is the spirit is is the spirit or the is is the spirit something like the soul, like an entity like the soul? You know, we we see here that in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the spirit, the Old Testament Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. Ruach, which means breath. Okay? So we see, therefore, then, um, the spirit or breath are the same thing. So the spirit is not a soul. Sometimes, you know, in loose language, people say your spirit or your soul. But the spirit is not the soul. A lot of people get confused. And so they think that the spirit and the soul are the same thing. But that is not so. The spirit and the soul are different. Now, God forms man out of the dust of the ground. That is his body. God breathed into man his rock or his breath, the Hebrew word for spirit or breath, and then man becomes a living soul. What happens when someone dies? When someone dies, they go back to the ground. The spirit or the breath of life, the power of life, goes back to God. Now, notice, The Bible is the same thing. Let us consider Job, that the breath and the spirit are the same thing. Let us look at Job chapter 27 and verse 3. Here the Bible says, All the while, my what? My breath is in me, and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, that is the way in which um, Hebrew literature is structured. You know, in school, I had to do Hebrew, and I had to study Hebrew literature, and uh, even in Hebrew poetry, they like to say the same thing twice. Many of the Psalms, you know, are like that. They use a structure that you refer to as parallelism. They would say the same thing twice, but using a different word. So notice here, that is what he's taking place here. He said, all the while my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. So in other words then, breath and spirit are the same thing. Of course, we do not have spirit in our nostrils. What do we have in our nostrils? We have breath, okay? That is breath. So every heartbeat comes from God. Huh? And so he says, Job is saying that God's breath is in me. The spirit of God is in my nostrils. In other words, the power of God is what gives me um, life. Again, we see in James 2 and verse 26, it says the body without the spirit or breath is what? Dead. There it is. James is telling us that once the body loses the breath, uh, what happens? Dead. So we see, therefore, then that death is simply a reversal of the creation process. Maybe I could illustrate this best if I consider a light bulb. So here I have a light bulb. And of course, I have the light bulb. It is off. It is not connected. And so now I plug in the light bulb. And when I plug in the light bulb or turn it on, now what happens? It now lights up. So the, 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 the light, the current that goes to the light bulb is like the breath of God. And the bulb itself is like the body. So what happens now if I unplug the light bulb? What happens? The, 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 the light disappears. Well, where does it go? Where does that energy I'm supposed to go? Well, you can say it goes back to the power station. And now we can say that light bulb is dead. So we see, therefore, then, that God's breath in our body is just like the power or the electricity in that light bulb. When that electricity goes out, then there is no light anymore. It means that... Uh, life has gone. So since the power to create life is with God, his spirit which gave life therefore returns to him. The body, the bulb goes to the dust. There is no illumination. 
the person does not live as a living soul. The breath goes back to God and the body goes to the dust. So the question is therefore then, after someone dies, do they know anything? Is there any consciousness at all in death? What does the Bible say? The Psalm 146 and verse 4 says, His spirit departs, again, breath, the ruach, departs, he returns to his earth. Again, you see the reversal of creation. In that very day, his plans perish. Huh? So it says, in that very day, his plans perish. Um, look at Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. Here the wise man says, For the living know that they will die. But the dead, but the dead knows what? The dead knows how much? Nothing. Nothing. Why not? Because the spirit of God has gone back to God. The breath has returned to God. The body has gone to the dust. And they are simply resting and secure. And he continues by saying, also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. So if the soul went to heaven when you died, at least there would be love. Because in heaven, you'll be loving God. But the Bible says that their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Why? Because they have no conscious existence. They are sleeping. In other words, then, death is asleep. The Bible teaches that death is like a sleep that lasts until Christ's second coming. Bible writers declare death as a sleep more than 50 times. Let's look at Psalm 13 and verse 3. It says, consider and hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the what? The sleep of death. Death is described as a peaceful rest or sleep in the Bible some 53 times. In the Bible, death is a rest. In the Bible, there is no immortal soul. First Kings 2 and verse 1, speaking of David, he says, now the days of David Jr. that he should die. David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. You know, one day, as Jesus and the disciples were traveling to visit the home of his, his, his friends, Lazarus, Mary and Martha, he got some bad news that Lazarus had become very sick and therefore he died. Now, Jesus waited three days before arriving at the home. And while they were on their way, Jesus made this statement to his disciples. John 11, verse 11 to 14. He says, our friend Lazarus sleeps. Huh? Death is asleep. But I go that I might wake him up. And then his disciples, not understanding what Jesus meant, says, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. You know, when you have a flu or a fever and so forth, or anytime you're sick, um, sleeping does, does the body good, helps you to recover. So they thought Jesus was speaking about Lazarus getting sick and then falling asleep in the evening. But the account says, however, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest in uh, sleep. So the disciples thought that, well, Lazarus is going to wake up in the morning. What's the big deal? And he's going to feel better. And so the account tells us, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You know, for Jesus, as for all Bible writers, death is but a sleep. Jesus then visited Lazarus' home and he decided to raise him from the dead as a demonstration of his, um, of his power. And so this will become a powerful testimony that indeed Jesus has the power to raise us from the dead. Now listen to what um, Jesus said to Martha. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now notice the words very carefully. Jesus didn't say to Martha, well, Martha, good news. And he's having a ding-dong time. Is that what Jesus said to Martha? Not at all. That's not what he said. Jesus explained to Martha that even death cannot snatch away our assurance of eternal life. You know, I would rather get my religion from Jesus than accept a hybrid pagan philosophy that has entered the Christian church through Greek philosophy. What about you? 
What did Martha believe about death? What did Martha believe about death? Well, we read in John 11, 24 and 25. Martha said to him, not that Lazarus is up in heaven having a good time. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection. At the what? At the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. You know, Martha, who received her religion directly from Jesus, believed that her brother would be resurrected in the last day when Jesus returned. Jesus would work a miracle in raising Lazarus from the dead to demonstrate that he can wipe away every tear from our eyes at funerals too. And so Jesus said, you need not be filled with sorrow and grief because there is a coming resurrection at the last day. We can see our loved ones again. They are sleeping. They are resting in God's love and fear. He has marked their tomb. He has a record of their identity in his mind. And thank God, Christ will come and raise them from the dead. Oh, my dear friends, this evening, the resurrection of Lazarus is the proof that Jesus will raise our believing loved ones too. So Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus was sleeping. Lazarus was resting in Jesus' love and fear. And Lazarus, we are told, came out of the grave alive. Now let's suppose that Jesus came to the grave and he, you know, believed what everybody else, what, I'm not everybody else, but what so many people believe that Lazarus was in heaven. Do you think that Jesus would have said, Lazarus, come forth? No. Jesus would have said, Lazarus, come down. Come down from heaven. Well, now, let me tell you something. If I were Lazarus and I was enjoying the bliss of heaven and Jesus asked me to come down, I would have to apologize to Jesus and say, there's no way I want to come down to earth. I'm having such a good time up here in heaven. I don't want to come down to earth. But my dear friends, because Lazarus was sleeping, the sleep of death, that is why Jesus Christ told him to come forth. And exactly like Jesus said, and exactly like Martha believed. You know, it is wonderful to know that God has marked the grave of our of that loved one, whether it's a husband or a wife or a child, an aunt or uncle, a grandmother, father or a mother, it is encouraging to know the heartaches of earth that they were troubled by are over for them. It lifts our spirit this evening to know that they are not suffering anymore because of cancer, because pain is over for them. What can be more reassuring than to think that our loved ones are in the grave and they are awaiting the call of the life giver. They are sleeping until the resurrection. In fact, Job 14 and verse 21 says, if his sons, talking about the dead man, if his sons are honored, he does not know it. If they are brought low, he does not see it. You know, I've had people that say to me sometimes, oh, you know, I just love to think that my mother or my grandmother is up in heaven right now and she's looking over me and she's enjoying my graduation, or she's enjoying my wedding. She would have liked to be here, but she's smiling. I know my grandmother is up in heaven, and she's smiling right now. But what if you have a husband? Huh? What if you're a wife, and you have a husband that is abusing you? Do you think that your mother, your dead mother, would be up in heaven feeling uh, um, comfortable, knowing that she's watching you getting abused by a husband, and she cannot do anything about it? You know, what if a mother dies and she's up in heaven and then she sees her child looking down the balcony of heaven, as some people think, and she sees her son running out in the street and there's a racing car that is coming down and she's there looking at a boy helplessly, not realizing, helplessly because she cannot do anything about it. You know, what if a mother is up there in heaven and her son has been drafted in the army and goes to war and what if caught by the enemy and He's tortured, his eyes are bulged out, and the mother is up in heaven and looking down, and she can do nothing about it. You know, what if a mother is up in heaven and her child is up in heaven? Do you think heaven would be a nice place for that mother to hear all that grief 
for their children's problem on earth. My dear friend, God is too merciful a God for that. And that is why we know as the Bible declares that death is a state of perfect rest or sleep until the resurrection when Christ wakes you up and says, now all the sorrow is over. You know, when we die, it's a perfect rest. You don't know about the passage of time. Now all the heartache is over. Now all the disappointments of life are over. And that is why the Bible says in Psalm 115 and verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down in what? Nor any who go down in silence. The Bible says that the dead do not praise the Lord. And my dear friends, if this is true, as I believe it is, because it is in the Bible, it means therefore then that our dead loved ones are not in heaven. Because everyone who is in heaven, according to the book of Revelation, they are bowing before the throne, they are praising God, they are singing his praises to the Lamb. And it means therefore then that if the dead do not praise God, there's no way in which they could be in heaven. My dear friends, if they were there, they would have been praising the Lord. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? That in 1600 places where the Bible mentions the word soul, but never the term immortal soul. But throughout the Bible, it describes death as a sleep. Oh, the Bible talks about the resurrection. It talks about the coming of Christ. It talks about graves being opened. The Bible is very plain on the subject of death. Paul says in Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When you die, all the demons in hell cannot cause us to be lost. When we die, our genuine identity, our genuine life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ comes, what will happen? When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Oh, wonderful promise. When that loved one dies and is a believer, their life was hidden with Christ in God. He has preserved their identity. They sleep. There is no perceived passage of time. They don't know about the trouble of the kids are given. They don't know about the heartache of their brothers and sisters. They don't know about the trauma of the, the, the trauma their wife faces. They are sleeping. There is no passage of time. As Christ comes, our life has been hid with Christ in God. And he calls us and says, John, come forth. He says, Mary, come forth. You know, the graves are open and we are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And as we are sent to meet Christ who died on the cross, we are going to meet Christ who, who loves us so much and longs for us to be with him throughout eternity. The Christ who went into the grave and came back out of the grave has redeemed us. What did Jesus himself say about death? In other words, then, what about the thief? Someone might say, what about the thief on the cross? What did Jesus mean when he spoke to the thief on the cross and promised, said, assuredly, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Well, the question is, did Jesus go to paradise that day? Now, let us look at, let us look at Jesus' um, answer more carefully. Now, you might remember that Jesus Christ was crucified on a Friday, that he was in the grave on the Sabbath, and then he was resurrected early Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Now, although Mary did not recognize him at first, look at, um, look at what happened when she finally did and rushed over to Jesus Christ and, and tried to hold on to, to him. And it is quite a story. Let's look at it. Um, so here is resurrection morning, and Mary came to and other Mary came to look for the grave for Jesus because she loved Jesus so much. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Um, whom are you seeking? Well, she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. That is what Mary. Um, is, is saying, Jesus said to her, Mary, uh -huh, in that familiar voice, she turned and said to him, Rabbanai. In other words, then, it's another way of saying what? I'm saying, teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for 
I have not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus said what? Do not hold on to me, Mary. This is Sunday morning. Do not hold on to me, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Don't miss that. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now the question is therefore then, how could Jesus have said to the thief on Friday that he would meet him in paradise that day when Jesus himself did not go to paradise on that day? Huh? Jesus did not go until, on, until Sunday, the first day of the week. Jesus himself, he said to Mary, do not touch me, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my father. Now, if we believe, if we believe that Jesus met the thief in heaven on Friday, then it means then that Jesus was lying to Mary on Sunday. And my dear friends, my Jesus is not a liar. Satan is the liar, according to John 8 and verse 44. And so we see, second, if Jesus had not yet ascended to his father on Sunday morning, how could he have told the thief on the cross that you're going to be with me in paradise that day? So are we forced to believe either um, Christ's statement to the thief on the cross or Christ's statement to Mary while he was in the garden? Well, when we encounter an apparent contradiction in the Bible, we immediately realize that something got to be wrong. There's something that is wrong, not with the word of God, but with our interpretation or our limited understanding with regard to translation. But this particular um, apparent contradiction can easily be solved when we look at just the placement of a comma in this statement. Now, the placement of a comma can make a world of a difference. Now, we must remember that the punctuation that are found in our Bible is not inspired. They were translated and the punctuation was given. In fact, if you were to look at very early manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, you would realize that all the letters run into one. There are no full stops, there are no commas, there are no question marks. Um, um, many of the early uh, manuscripts have all capital letters. So you have to know where a word starts and where a word ends. And that is not difficult to do. If I were to give you a simple statement like, I love you, you'll be able to read it. Okay, if they're all, if there's no, if they, there's no space between the letters. So that is how the manuscripts um, are. So when the translators translate um, these Greek manuscripts, they themselves have to determine the punctu um, punctuation. So punctuations were not added to the translations of the Bible until sometime after AD 1400 or so. So that is like 1400 years after Christ. So the punctuations are not inspired. The punctuations are placed there by trans, uh, translators. Now, let's look at uh, the big difference that a comma can make. Let's look at the big difference a comma can make. So let's consider this first statement. A woman without a man is nothing. Okay? So that's the first statement without any punctuation, uh, well, except for the period at the end. A woman without a man is nothing. Now, let's look at this statement now, but look at the placement of these commas. These two commas now. And now we have a woman without her, man is nothing. Okay, do you see the difference? Okay, forget the commas, and it says a woman without her man is nothing. But simply places the comma after woman, and after her, the whole statement now is different. A woman without her, man is nothing. So we see therefore then that, that there is a big difference that a punctuation can make. So therefore then, let's look at this statement that Jesus Christ told to the thief on the cross and see how the placement of the comma by the translator placed this difficulty. He said, and in Luke 23 and verse 40, he says, and Jesus said to him, assuredly I said unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is how most translations would have that um, written. But here, before they have placed the comma before you, instead of after today, okay? So let us look now at how this would read when the comma is placed after today. Now it says, and Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you today. In other words then, Jesus is saying, I'm making you the promise today. So today belongs to when Jesus is making the promise, not 
to when he will be in paradise. So, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, then, Jesus is saying, I'm making you the guarantee today. You are going to be with me in paradise. Not you're going to be with me in paradise today, but the promise I'm making is today. Now, the first, now we see then that the first passage in the Bible, um, don't con the Bible therefore doesn't contradict one another. When God says 53 times that death is asleep, and when God says over 1,600 times that there is no immortal soul, when the Bible says that the living know that they shall die, but the dead doesn't know anything, Ecclesiastes 9 and 5, verse 5. And you know that you have to place the comma correctly by placing it with the bulk of Scripture. But there is another reason. It is doubtful that the thief even died that day. Uh -huh. Because you remember, you remember that the Bible says that the Roman soldiers came around and they realized that Jesus was already dead. But the two thieves that were on the cross, they were not dead. And what did the soldiers do? The soldiers broke the legs of the two thieves. And so it was traditionally known, history tells us, that crucifixion was a slow death. And that is why the legs of the two thieves that died on either side of Jesus Christ, their legs were broken so they couldn't run away. And so it's, 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 it's therefore then um, very likely, it's very likely that the thief did not die on that day. In fact, the soldiers, the Bible implies that the soldiers were surprised that Jesus had already died, so they didn't bother to break his um, leg. So there is no clear text in the Bible that says the thief died that day. So what did Jesus mean then when he said to the thief, um, I will be with you in paradise? Well, Jesus said, I'm saying to you today, I'm making you the promise today, this day while I am dying on the cross, this day when it apparently appears as though I'm stripped of all my power. This day, when men and women are ridiculing me. This day, when blood is running down my face. This day, with a crowd of thorns on my head. This day, this day, when it doesn't look like that I can save anybody, I am making you the promise today. I'm making you the promise this day that sometime in the future, you will be with me in paradise. Because I'm going to be resurrected, and I'm going to return, and I'm sent to heaven. And your name is written down in my hand. And as I ascend to heaven, I will ascend there with your name on my lips. As I ascend to heaven, the tomb will be, and as I ascend to heaven, the tomb will be empty. Because of my resurrection, you can be resurrected one day as well. First Corinthians 15 and verse 55 says, Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? And verse 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you lost a loved one, a wife, a husband? Do you sometimes go to the grave of that loved one and kneel and put flowers there? The good news, my dear friends, is that death has lost its sting. The good news is that death has lost its hold. The good news is that the grave cannot hold us because Jesus Christ went into the grave. He came out of the grave and our Lord uh, our life is hid with Christ in God. Our identity is solid in Christ. Our names are on his lips. He's written pardon on the palms of his hands. And when he comes again, he will say, John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Ray, come forth. When Christ comes, he knows your name. He's going to call your name. And that dead loved one will come out of the grave. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such. The second death has no power. The second death is the eternal death. There is no eternal death for the believer. For the Christian, death is simply a sleep, a rest until Jesus comes. You know, we die and we sleep as believers until the coming of Christ. So it is only death from a human standpoint, but not from God's standpoint. And so we may die that first death, but it is not final. It is not an eternal because the Bible says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection 
over such the second death has no power. Has no power. Dear friend, this is the first resurrection. Jesus will come. Oh, he will stream down the corridor of the sky someday. The earth will be illuminated with the glory of God. And the dead are in Christ. Immortal bodies that cannot be touched by death again. And with the living, they will be caught up to meet Christ in the air. Oh, I love this passage so much. First Thessalonians 2 and verse 16 it says, For the Lord himself, oh, not an imposter, Satan is going to try to mimic and pretend to be Jesus huh? and do a fake second coming. Huh? But it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Oh, if we are already in heaven. Now, why would Christ have to come to resurrect these old bodies? Why? If we are already in heaven. If souls can live in heaven without a body, why would Jesus have come back all to get our bodies here in the cemetery? My dear friends, it just doesn't make common sense. All the Bible flows, all the Bible moves, all the Bible points to one glorious and climatic, climatic event. Why have Christians down through the ages long for the second coming of Christ? Why? Because these Christians through the centuries have believed that at the coming of Christ, the dead would be resurrected and they would meet their dead loved ones again. We would receive a glorious, immortal body and we would be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. That is why verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, and thus we shall always what? Be with the Lord. You know, Jesus made a promise to his disciples when he was leaving in John 14, 1 to 3. He told them, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. He says, I'm going to come back for you. I'm going to go and prepare a place and come back. My dear friends, if we were going to meet him, Jesus lied to his disciples. Huh? He should have said, I'm going and you're going to come to meet me. But he didn't say that. He says, I'm going to heaven and I will come back for you. I will come back for you. My dear friends, they are going to be, they're going to have glorious, immortal bodies. You will see that baby that you have laid in the grave again. That father that died of cancer, you're going to see again. That mother that you love to embrace, you'll embrace again. And together, we are going to be caught up to meet Christ in the sky. Oh, think of the excitement. Think of the of the thrill that will flow through our bodies. Hence, a husband and wife who are alive, they are caught up to meet Christ together. Their son ascends with them, their daughter who died in the car accident, ascends in them. All the resurrected saints, they are going to meet in the air. The husband looks at the wife and says, oh, there's Sally. Ah, there she is. She's also resurrected. There's a husband that is caught up and she appears more, uh, uh, there's a husband caught up and he looks at his wife and she appears even more beautiful than the day he married her. He had burnt her, he, he had buried her rather when she was 84 and he was 86. But now they are meeting together in eternal youth. And he says, darling, here you are. You have come out. You are more beautiful than ever before. Oh, my dear friends, that is going to be an exciting day indeed. Revelation 22 and verse 5 says, And they shall reign forever and ever. You know, even in facing death, we can hold the hand of Christ. Huh? We can completely trust Christ who lays our loved ones in, uh, uh, when we lay our loved ones in the grave. You know, the Christ who holds our, 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 holds our hand and holds us close to his breast and let us rest. This Christ, my dear friends, has our identities in his mind. And someday, he's going to resurrect our bodies from the grave. You know, many years ago, a famous pianist by the name of Thomas Darcy, at this time, he was living with his wife in Chicago. And while he was living there, he, one night, you know, he had to 
um, go out and for a gig. And his wife was nine months pregnant. The baby was soon to come any day now. And so she begged him and says, honey, why do you have to leave? I mean, the baby might even come tonight. And he said, oh, no. There's no way in which the baby is going to come tonight. And so he left and promised her that as soon as he's finished, he's going to um, take the first train from St. Louis and he's going to get and he's going to get back home. But you know, while he was there in St. Louis, and, it's, uh, and he was about to, 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 to return to Chicago, he got a telegram. And the telegram indicated that his wife had died during childbirth. Oh, of course, we can understand. His heart was broken. He started blaming himself, thinking about maybe I should not have left. Maybe, maybe it is my fault. And so he rushed back on the train and he got to the hospital. And when he got to the hospital, you know, uh, they told him, you know, you, you've had a bouncing baby boy, but we have also further sad news for you. You want to inform me as well to that your, your son also died. You know, Thomas Darcy, he became depressed. He became so depressed. For two years, he was depressed. He, 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 he couldn't go back to the piano again. He couldn't play music again because he had lost his wife and he had lost his son. And one day he was at a school, a university, went into a room and he realized that there was a piano. While he was there on that piano, in his own words, it says like, it's like droplets that came from heaven. There's a song, he says, that came to his mind. Song, a well-known song that came to his mind. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and help me stand. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Oh, precious Lord, take my hand. My dear listening friend tonight, if you too have lost a loved one, all you need to do is to ask Jesus to take your hand. All you can do tonight is ask Jesus, say, precious Lord, give me that peace. Give me that comfort. Give me that security. Precious Lord, help me to know that this loved one, as a believer, is safe and secure in your arms. Precious Lord, please comfort my heart. Precious Lord, keep me looking for that day. That day when you shall return. And all our dead ones will be resurrected. Oh, my dear friends, we have that wonderful assurance that someday Jesus will come and he will take us home. Oh, why not reach up to him right now and say, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn. Says he rode through the storms, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. Thomas Darcy continued. He says, when my way goes drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, Hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. My dear friends, tonight the Bible says that death is an enemy. But thank God for the believer. We have Jesus who promises us that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that he will take our hand. Do you want him to take your hand tonight? Why not pray with me at this time? Our loving Father and our God, indeed, death came because of sin, but it is so wonderful to learn tonight that our dead loved ones are not in hell, purgatory, or in heaven. They are in their graves, and they are resting the same way we fell asleep last night and woke up this morning, they are as having a dreamless sleep. 
It is so comforting to know what the Bible teaches about death that it is just the opposite of how we were made. Help, O oh Lord, that tonight hold on to this Bible truth so that we may not allow the enemy to deceive us. For oh, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.